So my name is uh, Mathieu Isidro, um, and I'm, um, I'm the deputy communication manager for the, the Square Kilometer Array. Um, before I start, I'd like to say thank you to um, Brigitte and all the organizers for having me here today. And, um, and I'd like to say as well that I actually uh, spent part of my childhood quite close to here, about an hour drive from Toulouse. And I started, my, my, my passion for astronomy started uh, here, in fact, and I started observing the night sky from, from the, the, the lovely skies in the countryside of southern France. And I came to the Cité de l'Espace many, many years ago when I was a child, and, and that's sort of where it all started. So um, it's great to be back here after all these years and to be standing here on the other side. Um, so here we go. I'll start by saying that this is a Twitter-friendly presentation and that most of my uh, slides are under 140 characters so that you can easily tweet them or take photographs of the screen. Now, how important is the SK? Just to start, who's heard about the SK before in this room? Square kilometer, array. Right? Okay, most people. Good, good. Now, if I show you this, what do you say? Okay, International Space Station. If I show you this, what do you say? Okay, so to put things into perspective, I'll cite someone who's um, a much more, uh, you know, a, a much more eloquent speaker and, and quite an influential person. That's David Villets, who used to be the science minister uh, in the United Kingdom and who donated or made a, a commitment of 120 million euros for the square kilometer array. So he came in March and he had to say this about the SKA. After the International Space Station and the Large Hadron Collider, the world's next great science project is the square kilometer array. So that's how important the SKA is, right? It's on that scale of project. And I'll try to demonstrate that in the next few slides. Now, before we start, I'll do a bit of Radio Astronomy 101. And I'll start by saying that size matters, um, at least in astronomy. Um, but size is limited. You can only build a telescope that big. Then it gets too big, and in terms of engineering, it's impossible to build. So the radio astronomers, or the astronomers in general, uh, found a really clever trick uh, it's called interferometry. That's the one word you need to remember about radio astronomy. And the way it works is that we simulate a big dish by building lots of small ones. Um, and that's called an array of telescopes. So you'll see this word a lot, array. So you can see it here. We put lots of smaller dishes, and then we fill the space in the middle so that we get more signal. And that way we're able to simulate a much larger dish. It's a really clever trick. So how big is the SKA, right? It's, it's big. It's going to be the largest scientific instrument on the planet, period. That, that's, if you need to remember something from this presentation, that's it. The largest scientific instrument on the planet. Now, to uh, sort of um, demonstrate that, uh, I'll give you lots of amazing facts in this presentation. You don't have to remember all of them, but it's filled of incredible facts. Um, we'll use enough optical fiber connecting all the dishes, all the telescopes, to wrap around the Earth twice. That's, that's how big this thing is, okay? And for those of you who love the ISS, and I guess that's everybody in the room, me included, um, the total collecting surface of this telescope will be over one million square meters. That's, if you want to compare it, that's 140 times the size of the ISS. Okay, that's a telescope that would be 140 times the size of the ISS. So it's a very, very big thing. Now, in terms of locations, the SKA is so big that we can't fit it on one continent. So it's going to be on two continents. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But anyway, it's going to be on two continents in Africa and in Australia. And the really important bit, it's like when you're buying a home, right? The three things that matter the most when you're buying a home are location, 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 right? So when we build a telescope, we want to put it in the best spot possible. And for a radio telescope, that's a very, very remote 
radio quiet location. Because radio astronomers don't like noise. They don't like radio emissions that interfere with the signals from the universe, right? They don't like cell phones, they don't like GPS, they don't like radio stations, okay? They want to go far out from civilization where they can listen to the faint signals from the universe. So we're building it in very remote locations in South Africa and in Australia. Now, just to give you a fun fact, in Australia, the area where we're going to build the SKA is the size of the Netherlands with a population of 100 people. Okay, that's, that's how remote it is. Um, we know them all and we, have a, we can have an annual barbecue and they'll all be invited and we can all, you know, we can know all of them on first name basis. So that's, that's the kind of remote location we're working in. Now, it's not just two countries, it's actually a partnership of 11 countries that are funding this project at the moment. And those 11 countries, which include countries like China and India and Canada and, and a number of countries in Europe, represent 40% of the world's population. Okay, so it's a big project. Um, a few more facts. We've um, teamed up with a number of institutions and private companies. Um, so that's over 100 of them spread in on six continents uh, in 20 different countries. So it's a massive partnership. And to design the SKA, these different institutions have teamed up in what we call consortia. Um, they're, they're groups of, of institutions and companies that work together, and each of them is working on designing a specific part of the telescope. Uh, so you have the supercomputer, you have the different antennas, the signal and data transport, the infrastructure on site, the instruments, all of these are different uh, consortia. And in fact, all these people are meeting next week um, in Fremantle in Western Australia, and that's what's been keeping me up at night and busy uh, in the last few weeks, uh, organizing that. So it's a very big event with over 300 people, engineers and scientists from 15 countries meeting in, in Western Australia next week. So I'll be flying there on, on Thursday. It's quite exciting. Not with Air France, no, uh, <laughs> definitely not. Um, now, these guys have been really busy uh, making instruments, prototype dishes, more instruments, putting cables, building uh, supercomputers, more instruments, putting antennas on the ground. So there's a lot of stuff happening, okay? These guys have been really, really busy for the last year, preparing all the, the, the groundwork to actually build a telescope. So I'm talking about this telescope, but I actually haven't said, you know, what it's going to look like. So it's actually not one telescope, it's actually four telescopes, which you could say four for the price of one, uh, almost. Um, so we, we call them instruments. It's kind of like the LHC, if you'd like, who's got four different instruments, right? It's got LHCB, it's got um, Atlas, Alice, and CMS, that's right. So it's sort, of, it's sort of a similar thing. And each instrument is a separate array of antennas that observes the universe at a different frequency range to get different signals and observe different things. So that's, that's the principle. So we'll have um, guys like this, which we call Christmas trees uh, in the SK family. Um, we actually have one in the office and it's probably going to be the Christmas tree for the Christmas party. Uh, we'll decorate it. Uh, and these guys are going to be in Western Australia. And then we have dishes which you're more familiar with uh, when we think of radio telescopes, which will be in, in Africa and, and in Australia. Those are 15 meter dishes, okay? They're big, they're very big. Um, and then at a later stage, oops, sorry we should have um, these, what we call aperture rays, which are really strange looking uh, antennas that should come later. Now, in terms of the actual construction, we haven't built the thing yet. Um, so we're due to start proper construction in 2018. And in five years, uh, over a period of five years, we'll be building and installing about 250 dishes and about a quarter of a million antennas, those Christmas trees in the Australian desert. Okay, that's a lot of antennas. That's a big telescope. Um, and the first observations should start in 2020 with a partial array. That's the first phase. 
The second phase is about 10 times the first phase. So in the 2020s, we'll ramp up to over 2,000 dishes and over 1 million antennas. Okay, it's, it's massive. Now, we've already started doing some things and we've already put prototype telescopes, we actually call them precursors, uh, on the ground. So there's one in South Africa on the left, that's the first antenna. By the way, that's not a um, photoshopped image, that's a real photograph of the first night of the antenna there. Um, ASCAP, which is another one in the middle in Australia, and MWA, which is a really strange looking sort of um, metal spider that you could see in a science fiction movie uh, that's in Australia as well. So these are already on the ground, and in fact, um, MWA on the right is already doing science. Now, I call them prototypes because they sort of lead the way towards what the SK is going to be able to do. But if you think about it in these terms, the largest array in the world is the ALMA telescope, which you heard about yesterday. I used to work there. It's a fantastic observatory uh, with 66 antennas, okay, 12 meter and 7 meter antennas in Chile. It's a, it's a fantastic telescope. But Meerkat, which is one of three SKA prototype telescopes, will on its own have 64 antennas that are 15 meter in diameter. So it's actually got more collecting power than ALMA. And it's just one of three prototypes of the SKA. So that's, that's the scale of things we're talking about. Now I've talked about this. I'll talk a bit about the computing because that's actually a really exciting part of the SKA. Um, I'll give you more amazing numbers in the next few slides, so get ready. Um, the dishes of DSK in the first phase will um, produce as much data from the universe as 10 times the global internet traffic. That's the kind of challenge we're facing in dealing with the amount of data that will come from this telescope. Now, to process all this data, we'll need a supercomputer that's um, about 100 million PCs a very, very powerful supercomputer. And I'll show you a short video to illustrate this, because we talk about big data a lot. So this, this is big data. And it's the, the first phase of 10% of DSK. So those are some of the sizes of a few things around the world. Library of Congress, the NASDAQ index, CERN data, YouTube data every year. About 15 petabytes for YouTube and CERN. Searches on Google, 100 petabytes a year. Uploads to Facebook, 180 petabytes a year. And now we get to the SK. Oh, sorry, business emails, 3,000 petabytes or three exabytes every year. Now the first phase of the SK, the three different instruments that will be built in the first phase, together will produce, will have an archive of six and a half exabytes, twice the business email sent every, every year. Global internet traffic in 2013, total data produced by the SKA in the first phase. Okay, that's, that's the kind of scale we're talking about. Um, maybe I'll show it again, actually, because it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so all these numbers have been checked and done properly by our engineers. Um, so th remember, this is just the first phase of the SKA, right? So th what happens is that the data you produce from all the antennas then goes to a correlator which combines them and that reduces the amount of data. And then that correlator sends it to a, what we call a science data processor which processes the data, chucks away everything we don't need and only keeps the bit that we need. And that's what you see in the next bubble. That's when we've processed all of it and when we only keep the interesting bit, we still get six and a half exabytes every year, right? twice as much as the um, business email sent worldwide. Internet traffic 2013, total data produced by the antennas. Boom. <laughs> so it's big. Right, let's move on. I'll talk a bit about the science. Um, so we'll look at really exciting things. We'll look at how the first galaxies were formed. We'll look back 13 and a half um, billion years ago 
to a time when galaxies didn't exist, when there was mostly what we call neutral hydrogen in the universe, and then the first stars formed, and they ionized this hydrogen gas, and the first galaxies started forming. So the SKA will be uniquely capable as a radio telescope to look at this time of the universe, and that will give us a really good understanding of how uh, galaxies formed. We look at uh, magnetic fields in space because we don't know how they work. Every object that's got a mass in the universe has got a magnetic field, the sun, the earth, galaxies, and we, we don't know how they work and how they can be powered over long periods of time. So we'll be looking at this in, in close detail. And we'll be, for the physicists in the room, we'll be testing Einstein's theory of relativity. We'll be looking at gravity. And what we'll do is that we'll observe uh, the effects of the predicted gravitational waves on objects. So gravitational waves are sort of ripples in the fabric of space-time, which have never been observed. Uh, so when an object's got a mass, it sort of sinks in the fabric of space-time and sort of deviates any light or things that, that go around that object. And we'll be looking at the effects of these gravitational waves to fine-tune um, the theory of relativity to get a better understanding of this. So really exciting for the physicists. And I forgot one last bit. If I say radio telescope, you probably think aliens, right? Or search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that's true. And if I put those two things together, you probably think, hmm, Jodie Foster in contact, right? So great movie, um, good fun. And actually, we'll be doing something a bit similar. Uh, we will actually do SETI, but on a scale that's never been done before, right? because we'll have a huge telescope. So the SKA, to give you a fact, will be able to detect an airport radar on a planet tens of light years away. That's the sensitivity of the telescope. So where I work at the moment, we've got the world's third biggest radio telescope. And this radio telescope uh, can pick up a signal from a cell phone on Mars. That's how sensitive it is. But it's, it's already the third biggest in the world. This thing is a completely different scale. Right? So how many planets is that, right? Well, in the neighborhood, uh, in our galactic neighborhood, there's about 2,000 star systems that we should be able to survey with the SKA for radio signals. So it's a, it's a you know, massive undertaking, a really exciting prospect. Now, I'll finish with this. Why build the SKA? If you're not convinced yet of why we should do this, I've got a few more facts. The science I mentioned is Nobel Prize winning science. It's not me saying it, it's eminent scientists. Chief scientist of the National Radio Astronomical Observatory of the USA says that some of the science we'll be doing could be Nobel Prize winning. And that's, that's the importance of it. And it's going to change the way we do astronomy, but also it's going to change our understanding of physics and probably beyond as well. Hubble, everybody knows Hubble. Hubble changed the way we saw and understood the universe. The SK will have 50 times the sensitivity of Hubble. 50 times. And the best part is the questions we don't even know to ask yet. The discoveries that we'll make that we're not even searching for. That's the most exciting part. But there's also all the R&D, all the money you're putting in research and development, all the spin-offs you can get from better computing or processing power, uh, faster data transport, um, energy efficient computers, all of this can lead to really uh, important spin-offs for society. Just to give you a fun fact, Wi-Fi was invented by an astronomer working in Australia. Okay? He was looking for black holes and he invented Wi-Fi. And so that led to a patent that was awarded to CSIRO in Australia, part of the patent for Wi-Fi. So every time someone bought a device in the world with Wi-Fi on it, part of the money went to CSIRO to do more research. So that's how important it is. Job creation, human capital development, uh, employing really, really skilled people, 
um, in, in, lo in lots of countries. And of course, it's the human adventure, right? We're all working together on this project, over 500 people, to build something that's never been done before, something that we thought was impossible. And for what? Not for money, not for profit, not for fame, but to better the human understanding of the universe. And that's really exciting when you think about it. It's not a project for the next three years, the next political so cycle. It's a project for the next 50 years. We're working on a scale that is beyond the normal scale of the media, of politics, of things like this, just to improve our knowledge of the universe and of the laws of nature. And all these people are working together, uh, um, sort of facing this incredible challenge to do this, to build this machine. And that's really exciting.